Nice to meet you all. I'm Rob Taylor. Uh, I'm kind of a bit of an old man of open source. So I was building embedded systems with Linux in in the late 90s. Uh, about a decade ago, I founded my first open source consultancy, which is a company called Collabora. And then seven years ago, one called CodeThink. Um, and they're both about 60 people or something and relatively successful. So I've, uh, I kind of was there in the early days when people would say, how is anyone going to build a business out of open source? Uh, and uh, 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 why would anyone use that? Why would anyone move, move from Windows, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I'm laughing now. Um, so what earlier this year, I decided to start getting a little bit bored with uh, open source software services. So I'll look around for something new to do. Um, and one of the things that's kind of hit a bit of a let me a bit a bit of a knee. So so open source. Obviously, I think I don't, I don't need to tell you all, but this is talk I can give for a few people. Open source is obviously incredibly successful now. Almost every um, piece of infrastructure in the world is now running on Linux, including Microsoft's. So, you know, can <laughs> it's totally transformed the software supply chain. In the early days, you remember that, you know, software used to come in boxes. Now, you, that seems like complete and utter madness. So, yeah, open source, clearly a good way to go. And I don't, I don't need to tell you guys you're here to do open source hardware. Um, so one of the things that's kind of happened recently-ish is it's quite cost effective to fab a chip now. And also it's quite uh, there's there's you know buying buying capable FPGAs is getting cheaper and cheaper. Um, does anyone know how much it costs to fab something to fab a chip in twenty eight nanometers at the moment? <laughs> okay, a small number of test, a test run. Oh, test run. Yeah. Whole wafer? Pa partial wafer, MPW. 1500? Oh, For a 28 nanometer. <laughs> so we've got, we've got, we've got 1500, 50 mil million, and a 100K. Well, I think he's probably. Oh, uh, I actually drive my slide. So, in a recent article in E Times, Dave Patterson from the Spy Lab in Berkeley asked the, uh, the E Times readership the same question. Um, and this was the response. So, the reader average was the smallest die you could get. 20 people assume you know, the average is about 2.3 millimeters, get a minimum die run of about 190. Average cost per untested die. So, the total cost, reader average, came out at $170,000. With, an, uh, with a standard deviation of half a quarter of a million. And so this is the, the actual value, this is from the Aspire lab that do a lot of fabbing of chips, is that you can, the smallest die you can get on, I think this is actually TSMC, uh, is this going to be TSMC? It's probably TSMC. <laughs> so, well, I, I'm, I'm quoting Dave Passon on this one. Well, I had, I had somebody from um, iMac uh, quoting the, the cost of doing this. And the quote was around $25,000 was appropriate for uh, Moscow to process technology in that time. So, um, well, actually, no, I mean, because you can go and actually, you can go and actually re read the numbers. So you can go and we have a, a nice thing in Europe called Europractice. Yeah. And you can go there and you yeah, actually... Was that an academic price or a commercial price? Uh, I believe that this is an academic price. Right. So you, 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 you add another 50% for commercial price. Yeah. 
Okay. So, uh, so commercially, we can assume there's a bit of variation in this. <laughs> um, I may be misquoting mis this. Might be 45 as well. It's not entirely clear from the article. But suffice to say that it's so the article that that this comes from was arguing that for actual man manufacturing of heart of silicon, it's now possible to do a an agile type process because your your individual cost runs are low enough that that's you know a fraction of an engineer per year. Um, even if even at, even at the prices you've probably been quoted, it's still within an an e a year of an engineer's time. Yeah. So so if you so your the benefits, you know, the benefit cost benefits are, are like quite a different place than the fifty million. That is what people assume. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You got a lot of these. Are you waiting a quarter, uh, a quarter before you can run a thing? Yeah. So, is there, everyone still hear me? Okay. Does it sound like? Yeah. It does sound like the, um, the sound's gone off. But it sounds like it's cut out to me. Yeah, that's because the that's light's gone off. No, I uh, think it's just run out of battery. Okay, oh, right. Fingers crossed it held. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so, and uh, as part of this, the Aspire Lab in Berkeley's been pumping out a large number of open source processor designs. Um, so we now got open source processor designs, which have actually been fabbed, which I think is one of the, is something new in the last couple of years because I don't think OpenRisk ever really got fabbed out and Parallela isn't actually an open source processor design. Hmm? It's gone again. I'll just talk loudly. Oh, you got you got to split another battery. Cool. Yeah, and combined with this, you, we can act, you know we've got things like the Z board now, which you can actually put a number of um, cores on and, f and actually do a bit of open source processor design. Um, so, so I've already mentioned the Aspire Lab. So they back I mean, it's about five years ago now they defined an open source instruction set. It's called Risk Five, uh, and they did a good patent troll and made sure that this is something that no one can claim to um, have patents on. And it's a nice small instruction set, uh, which makes implementations of it quite a bit easier. Right, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, and so, so yeah, so Berkeley have a number of calls that they've implemented with instru this instruction set, which are open source. Uh, IIT Madras. IIT Madras have a, a core, an out of order core that they've implemented. Berkeley have a tiny core, uh, a kind of flexible parameterized core and an out of order core. Um, there's been, you know, some individuals have done their own cores implementing the instruction set. So Clifford Wolf's done one, and Tommy Thorne's done one. Um, and I think I believe there's a commercial one um, done by Blue Spec guys. And I came across these guys because uh, oh yeah, the out of order core from. So one of the things that people ask me is it, it, uh, how capable are these cores? Are they, you know, are they, are they, are they something you can use for serious work? So this is the in simulation the Berkeley Boom, which is their out of risk core. Uh, so it's a 64-bit risk risk core, um, two I three issue out of order six stage. In simulation, they're hitting about just under four core marks per megahertz, which is, you know. Less, it's sub an i, it's an i5's around five, 
from what's megahertz. It's better than an Cortex A9. It's probably about the same as an A57. Um, and if you were to put it out on a 40G plus TSMC, it'd be about a millimeter square. So you can quite fit quite a lot of these on uh, a design. Uh, so that's, that's, that's pretty capable. And I came across these guys because I was talking with the low risk guys who I think if anyone was here last year, Alex came along and gave, gave a talk about this. So this is um, uh, Rob Mullins, Gavin Ferris and Alex Bradbury founded a foundation to build an open source system on a chip. Uh, kind of spurred on by by these open source, by the fact that we now have open source process designs that have been fabbed out. So that gives you a bit of degree of confidence that you can, we can actually fab something in a realistic time frame. Um, so, so this, to kick this off, it's about a year and a bit, year and a half ago. Um, there's been, it's been, it's been a GSOC project this summer. That's quite a lot of good stuff happened. Uh, including a bridge to wishbone for those who are interested in the open, so we can use some of the stuff from open cores. Um, and there's a few interesting ideas that are going to be executed in this as, as sort of posh, partially research ideas like tagged memory um, and uh, using tiny little cores as your I.O. drivers rather than doing custom 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 circuitry. Uh, so yeah, so so uh, my background before uh, in the last few years was I was involved a lot with the ARM server projects that were going on around. Uh, and one of the problems you have is if you're trying to do I'd have people coming to me who had very specific application domain problems and then trying to find hardware which are, which was a sufficient the right shape to s for their application domain problem. And if you're trying to build something out of either, you know, if you've got enough money going, buying, buying stuff out, build, build stuff out, stuff out of standard IP blocks you can buy in, or you're build, building stuff out of um, available uh, silicon, you end up with a, a problem that you're just not building something in high enough volume for people to care about what you're doing. So either you can't, so most of the time, you just can't even buy it. Or if you get to a point where you can buy it, they mess you around because you're just not important enough to them. You're not volume enough. And volume really matters to these guys because the cost of building a system on a chip is getting more and more expensive because, more, because the commodity levels higher and higher. And you know, so the margins are going down. So they, so they care a lot more about volume than they ever have done. So, from my point of view, that sounds like a perfect storm where open source silicon design can start, we can start going after that system on a chip market as, as an open source community um, with a bit of commercial backing. So that's what I'm trying to do with Nerebus is help create, to help join up the aspects of this community actually get us the and along with the low risk guys to get us to the point where we're actually fabbing some stuff. Um, so on the on the application this specific design the sort of sort of problems I had coming to me, uh, one of the big parts of the problem domain is 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 fast interconnect so between cores and and, and between sockets, between uh, between actual chips. Um, and I was really happy to find out there was a project at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is, uh, say, you know, uh, across the road from the Aspire guys, to do a open source fabric. So it's called Open Sock Fabric. And this is basically, if you, if you know anything about fabric, there's a guy called uh, Bill... Uh, Bill Daly, who wrote the book, literally. And if you go and do what is pretty much um, best practice, sort of thing you'd find in a cray, these guys have kind of written it up already as freely available 
open source chisel code. And they're a nice friendly bunch of guys who are happy to be nice to work with. So this is just kind of a top level architecture for anyone who really cares. Uh, does anyone know enough about fabrics and wormhole routing and VC routing to want me to talk about it? <laughs> Maybe we'll do it separately then. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so basically it, it supports uh, lock-free routing, DOF. Uh, it's got, um, it, it's, it's, it supports wormhole and VC and has a number of topologies, flexible topologies you can use with it, you can use it with. Uh, and also can hook out to AXI for, so you can start talking to sort of IP blocks and then plugging into ARM cores. Um, I uh, probably won't talk through that. <laughs> hmm? And a lovely picture of the woods. So, where am I at with this? Uh, at the moment, really, I'm going around talking to people and trying to, because one of the things in this area, there are actually quite a lot of individuals, um, academic groups, and, and a few companies actually doing some open source digital design, open source silicon. Um, but it's very fragmentary at the moment. It's kind of a lot of not, not invented here going on, a lot of kind of individual people just, just just doing stuff for a bit of fun. And so I'm trying to join the bits of the ecosystem together, get people talking, and, and see if we can start having a bit more of a, uh, a cohesive approach. Um, uh, so, so hence why I'm giving this talk today, and I've been giving this talk at, uh, at universities. I've been at Edinburgh, I've been at Cambridge, I've been to Southampton. Um, and they'll be, I'll be giving this talk at Orconf in a couple of weeks' time. So if anyone is really interested, definitely come over to Orconf. That's where the excitement stuff's going to be happening at the moment. So that's the Open Risk Conf in Geneva. Uh, it's, at, it's at CERN on the 10th and 11th, I think. 9th, 10th, 11th. Um, and I think that's about it, really. Uh, excuse it. Excuse it being a little on the um, on the fragmentary side. I've been up and down the country and slightly fried. <laughs> so if you're interested in coming and talking about it, um, IRC Low Risk OFTC and um, slash Nerebus, which currently just has me in, I just created it today. Uh, risk Risk V on free node. Um, risk V dot a good place to go and read up about the the, the ISA and the and the calls they've got there. There's a couple of good mailing lists, H HLE, Dev and SW Dev, depending on which bit you're interested in. OpenSockFabric.org for the uh, for the fabric. Uh, Nervous that comes the commercial placeholder site and at Compute Futures the my Twitter. Okay. My email, you can go to Nervous.com, it's on there. <laughs> Any questions?